The Tolkien Road, Episode 69, The Lord of the Rings, The Mirror of Galadriel. All right, go ahead. The Hey there, fellow travelers. Welcome to The Tolkien Road, a long walk through the works and philosophy of J.R.R. Tolkien. On this episode, we continue through The Lord of the Rings with Book 2, Chapter 7, The Mirror of Galadriel. Before we get started, why not hop on over to iTunes and leave The Tolkien Road a rating and feedback? It's a great way to show your support for the show and takes less than a minute. Thanks for listening, and enjoy. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Tolkien Road. John here, joined by Greta. Sup, sup. Hey, hey. All right. We are in Chapter 7 of Book 2 of The Lord of the Rings. Yeah. The Mirror of Galadriel. Mirror of Galadriel. Mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's the fairest of them all? Yeah. I'd say it's... uh, Probably Galadriel. Probably Galadriel. Yeah. Yeah. She's pretty fair. That's uh, Yeah, that's a good guess. Mm -hmm. But we'll find out for sure in this chapter. Uh, Yes, we will. We shall. We will and we shall indeed. All right, so... We're just going to jump right in. Well, yeah, we're, Let's just do it. We're doing haiku near the end now. So, I know, I know. Yeah, in case you weren't listening the last two episodes. I was listening. Okay. Um, no respect. Yeah. So, um, when we pick up this chapter, the Fellowship has been uh, journeying from the eastern slopes of the mountains, uh, the Misty Mountains. Right. After leaving Moria. Yep. They've been journeying towards Lothlorien, and they've been in Lothlorien for a little while now. Yes. Before they've been in the forest of Lorien, but they haven't quite reached the center of it. Right. They were traveling blindfolded for a while, mm-hmm. and then they've removed their blindfolds, and they're getting kind of close to the heart of of uh, Lothlorien. Right. So, and they arrive at this little city called um, Karas Galathon. Karas Galathon. Karas Galathon. Yeah. Um... Uh, it says, suddenly they came out into the open again and found themselves under a pale evening sky, pricked by a few early stars. There was a wide, treeless space before them, running in a great circle and bending away on either hand. Beyond it was a deep foss, lost in soft shadow, but the grass upon its brink was green, as if it glowed still in memory of the sun that had gone. Upon the further side there rose to a great height, a, a green wall encircling a green hill thronged with mallorn trees. Uh, taller than any that had yet they had yet seen in all the land. Their height could not be guessed, but they stood up in the twilight like living towers. In their many-tiered branches and amid their ever-moving leaves, countless lights were gleaming, green and gold and silver. Haldir turned towards the company. Welcome to Karas Galathon, he said. Here is the city of the Galathrim, where, where dwell the, the Lord Celeborn and Galadriel, the Lady of Lorien. But we cannot enter here, for the gates do not look northward. We must go round to the southern side, and the way is not short, for the city is great. Um, You know, I was thinking as as I was reading that this time around, um, that it kind of reminds me, in a way, this this city, Karas Galathon, Galathon, reminds me of um, Gondolin, right? Mm. From the Silmarillion. Yeah, but it's I kind of that. it's kind of yeah. protects like hidden, protected mm-hmm. by this, you know, Gondolin is protected by this wall of mountains, and then it's kind of this shining city in the middle of of this you know little fort, natural fortress. Yeah, right. Yeah, Lothlorien You're right. is surrounded by the forest, and it's this shining city in the middle of this forest. You know, so good call. I wonder if it's uh if it's intended to have any, any relation, yeah. you know, inspiration from Gondolin. Yeah. But I just that just struck me. I can see. That's cool. But I don't know. Can you kind of envision what this looks like in your head? I think so. Yeah. Yeah, it's a place that I would want to visit. Yeah. I'd like to go to there. Go to there. Yeah. yeah. Um. Yeah. So I, I don't want to. I don't want to get too bogged down in all of the description. I mean, you can read that there, but um, you know, it's it's pretty beautiful. That I think it's worth trying to picture in your mind's eye Absolutely. all of these. Yeah. All you know, basically a city built from trees, built from beautiful, uh, tall trees. Um, full of lights and you know kind of on this on this large mound 
you know, yeah. risen on this large mound yeah. here. Um, so, um, here dwell Celeborn and Galadriel. So Celeborn is the lord of Lothlorien, and Galadriel uh, is the lady of, of Lothlorien. And it's interesting, I mean, um, you know, I should have gone back and looked this up. Do I have some really in here? No, I don't. Darn it. Um, so, Galadriel, of course, just a brief refresher on her. Um, Galadriel is um, is one of, you know, she she knew Feanor and Fingolfin. Right, and yeah, she was, she was in the Silmarillion. Right. Yeah. In fact, I think she was, who was she a daughter of? She was a daughter of Finarfin, I think, right? Oh, was she? I think so. I think she was one of Finarfin's daughters. Sounds good to me. Yeah. So, um, yeah, she... Um, she knows what the Blessed Realm is like. She lived there for a long time, and so she brings some of that, um, some of that with her to Lothlorien. So she's been alive a long time. Yes, she has. Yeah. I mean, several, you know, at least four or five thousand years, and in you know probably longer. It's right. Crazy though, and she still yeah. looks amazing. <laughs> That's because she's immortal. I know. Still not fair. Yeah. Well. I wish I aged that well. Yeah. Don't we all? I knew you were going to say that. Um, well, don't you just know everything? I do. I can read your mind. You don't know me. I can I can see inside your thoughts, just yes. like Galadriel. Just like Galadriel. Mm-hmm. Um, so they meet with Galadriel. They, they, uh, Caliborn and, and Galadriel want, an, want a meeting with uh, the Fellowship. and right. uh, And so... At first, Galadriel wants to speak about um, Gandalf. Wants right, and they know they're Gandalf. coming, right? Because yeah. they've heard from... Um, a messenger. From Rivendell. Yeah. Right, they've, they've been in touch with um, Elrond. Right. Right. Which I was thinking about that, and I don't think it specifies exactly how, and I was kind of wondering, like, what... How would they have... It had to be a messenger. Well, I know... Well, but was it, like, a bird? I was going to say, it's probably a bird. Yeah, that's what I was kind of thinking. Yeah. Because the bird would have had the easiest time getting over the... The mountains. The mountains, and yeah. would have been faster than they are. And right. I mean, elves are pretty swift on their feet, but... Yeah. But I mean, I guess, I, guess it could have been a, I guess it could have been an, a lone elf. Well, how or, much time do you think has passed since they've left Rivendell? I don't have my copy of Return of the King here. I could tell you exactly. Um, oh, is there a timeline you know in Return of the King? Yeah, let me see if it's in oh. it's Atlas of Middle-Earth. I'm looking at the Atlas of well, Middle-Earth. Can you just guesstimate? Character. It's been a few months, I think. Oh, has it been that long? Okay. I think. So there would have been time for somebody, for an elf on foot to reach them. Right. Yeah. Um, hold on, let's see. So, Rivendell, um... I didn't mean to sidetrack us. Okay, fine, I won't get sidetracked. So you can look it up in the appendix. I'm They'll just have, trying to figure out, okay, there. I'm just trying to figure out if there, there would have been time for an elf on foot to get... Yeah. It's definitely been at least, it's definitely been a few weeks since they left Rivendell, and I think it's been closer to a few months, if I'm not mistaken. But it was, the messenger was most likely a bird, because I don't think they would have risked an elf on foot with all the orcs. Right, yeah, because there's a chance that the elf could be captured and tortured and forced to speak and all that kind of stuff. A bird would have been quicker and less suspicious. Right. Yeah. So, um,. So as concerns what happened to, what happened to, Gan- to Gandalf, uh, Galadriel says, uh, Gandalf the Grey set out with his company, but he did not pass the borders of this land. Well, it's interesting, and I just say real quick that yeah. she knew, but her the Lord did not. Yeah. Lord Celeborn was like, wait a second. Celeborn. Sorry. Lord Celeborn was like, well, I thought there was nine of you, but I only see eight. Mm-hmm. So he didn't know who was missing, but Galadriel did. Yeah. What's up with that? Uh, She's obviously more powerful than he is. I th- probably. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I think she has. Um, I think she has some kind of force connect. Like she has com- some kind of like almost like force ability. You know, okay. like to like realize, like detect other people's being. Got but it. here's the other thing. Actually, I think now that you asked the question, that's a good question. I think here's why. What do we find out that Galadriel has in this chapter? The mirror. No, not the mirror. Oh. What else? The ring. Her ring, right? Yeah. She has one of the three elvish rings. Mm-hmm. And who has the other ring? Who has who had the two other rings? Do you remember? I don't. Does Gandalf? Gandalf has one. Gandalf has one. 
and Elrond has one. Oh, right? Elrond has one. Yeah. So, um, so she, she would have been able to have to detect Gandalf, right? Um, and now uh, she can't because detect of him that, anymore. Because the rings are linked. Yeah. They're able. To I think that's why. I think that's why she has this capability. To know what Gandalf. If anybody else knows of any other reason, let us know. But that's my understanding. Why she didn't share it with her husband? The ring. No, the fact that that Gandalf had fallen. Maybe it just didn't come up in conversation. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I it, just, it only happened like a couple of days before. Well, I guess that's true. That's true. I just found it curious that she knew and he didn't. Yeah. That's all. Well, she doesn't know. All she knows is that he's she's lost touch with him, right? Gandalf the Grey set out with his company, but he did not pass the borders of this land. Now tell us where he is, for I much desired to speak with him again. But I cannot see him from afar unless he comes within the fences of Lothlorien. A gray mist is about him, and the ways of his feet and of his mind are hidden from me. That's Galadriel speaking. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. He remained in Moria and did not escape, Aragorn says. I see. Um, and they speak a little bit about Doran's Bane, about his battle with Doran's Bane. Kelleborn says, tell us now the full tale. Um, uh, and Aragorn uh, recounted all that had happened upon the pass of Carothras and in the days that followed. And he spoke of Balin in his book, and the fight in the chamber of Mazarbul, and the fire and the narrow bridge, and the coming of the terror. An evil of the ancient world, it seemed, such as I have never seen before. It was both a shadow and a flame, strong and terrible. It was a Balrog of Morgoth, said Legolas, of all Elfbanes the most deadly, save the one who sits in the dark tower. Indeed, I saw upon the bridge that which haunts our darkest dreams. I saw Durin's bane, said Gimli in a low voice, and dread was in his eyes. Um... So, they speak of having seen Doran's Bane, um, mm -hmm. you know, which is the the greatest of the elf banes, uh, save one, who resides in the Dark Tower. So, this this particular Balrog was, um, and I don't think I mentioned this in, the, in two episodes ago, but the Balrogs, um, I'm pretty sure, I think you might, there might be some conflicting info about this, but the Balrogs are Maiar, right? Oh. They're actually, they were Maiar. They're they were in Maiar. Maiar. Like, like. Sauron is, oh, right? They're fallen Maiar. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Who were corrupted by the Dark Lord, by okay. Morgoth. Okay. Interesting. Um, the Gandalf is also a Maiar, is that right? Yes. So that's why he was able to, they were able to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe in that standoff. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Because they're both Maiar. Right. So they have equal abilities, except one is good and one is evil. Well, I don't, and I don't know if it's exactly equal abilities, but they're of roughly equivalent stature. Okay. You know? Okay. Like, gotcha. you know in terms of that kind of spiritual Their heritage dimension. Is right. The same. Okay. Um so um yeah, so they speak they speak some of Doran's Bane and then um uh Gimli, of course, um uh, is feels weird about being here and Celeborn is not very happy that he's here. Yeah, he's, <laughs> he's good, what were you gonna say? I was gonna say I thought that was funny. Yeah. I thought I thought that Celeborn's response to Gimli was funny. He's like, "Oh, if I had known that one of them, one of you guys was a dwarf, I never would have let you in." Yeah. Like, ouch. Yeah, that's pretty. Uh, that sounded a little bit like um, old Thingol, you know. Yeah, it does. You're absolutely Sounds a little right. Bit like old yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, which I imagine Galadriel, having known Thingol and having lived in that in the kingdom of Doriath for. You know, sometime probably was rolling her eyes when Kelleborn uh -huh. said that. Yeah, and um, she quickly comes to Gimli's defense, which I yeah. appreciate. Yeah, she yeah. said, go ahead, you read that? Um, yeah, sure. She says, he would be rash indeed that said that thing, said Galadriel gravely. Needless were none of the deeds of Gandalf in life. Those that followed him knew not his mind and cannot report his full purpose, but however it may be with the guide, the followers are blameless. Do not repent of your welcome to the dwarf. If our folk had been exiled long and far from Lothlorien, who of the Galadrim, even Celeborn the Wise, would pass nigh, would not wish to look upon their ancient home, though it had become an abode of dragons. Yeah. And then um, she goes on to basically kind of, you know, to show her respect for the lore and the, mm -hmm. the, um, the heritage of the dwarves. Because she mentions all their, you know, their pillared halls and... Where they're mighty kings, and you know, I think I think Galadriel has some respect for the dwarves. Yeah, well, and there's something, you know, there's something deeper going on here too, because it says he met her eyes, 
Gimli mm-hmm. met her eyes, and it mm-hmm. seemed to him that he looked suddenly into the heart of an enemy and saw their love and understanding. Wonder came into his face, and then he smiled and answered. Mm-hmm. He rose clumsily and bowed in dwarf fashion, saying, Yet more fair is the living land of Lorien, and the Lady Galadriel is above all the jewels that lie beneath the earth. So I thought that was, yeah. um, you know, a beautiful little hint of, you know, reconciliation Absolutely. Yep. between yep. the dwarves and the elves, potential, yeah. the potential for reconciliation between yes. them. Um, yeah, so, um, I think Cal- Celeborn re- recants, right? Yeah. He's like, like, Gimli, forget my harsh words. I spoke in the trouble of my heart. Mm-hmm. So there is, like, they're definitely on friendlier terms now. Yeah. Yeah. For sure, for sure. Yeah. Um, and so here we come upon this, you know, word of the long defeat, which we, mm-hmm. we spoke of briefly in the yeah. last chapter, and we won't, won't dwell too long upon this, but, uh, let's just hear what Galadriel has to say about the long defeat. Um, your quest is known to us, said Galadriel, looking at Frodo, but we will not here speak of it more openly. Yet not in vain will it prove, maybe, that you came to this land seeking aid, as Gandalf himself plainly purposed. For the lord of the Galathrim is accounted the wisest of the elves of Middle-earth, and a giver of gifts beyond the power of kings. He has dwelt in the west since the days of dawn, and I have dwelt with him years uncounted. For ere the fall of Nargothrond, or Gondolin, I passed over the mountains, and together through ages of the world we have fought the long defeat. Uh, and and she talks some about the White Council, which is um, something that happened during the uh, the period of that the Hobbit takes place in. Right. You know, it's not actually in the book. They show it some in the movie, but uh, in the Peter Jackson films, but it's not actually in the book. Um, but this long defeat. So, um, you know, this long defeat. It, just to just to kind of hint at what it means here, and then and what Tolkien, you know, where this Tolkien got this idea from was. You know, it's this idea that um, it's a very elvish idea that the world is kind of slowly being given over to darkness, mm-hmm. right? That the light of the two, you know, you think about it, the original, when when the world was first formed, the elves didn't even see this, but when the world was first formed, the, um, the Valar constructed the two lamps, right? right? The one at the north and the one at the south, and right. the world was like this perfectly symmetrical piece of land mm-hmm, right mm-hmm. and then Melkor came along and, and threw down the lamps and um, and like marred the shape of the world and everything right and that's when they created the two trees right um, and the two trees weren't quite as powerful as the two lamps because it wasn't always daytime okay. with the two trees the two lamps it was always daytime right, right? the two trees you had a mingling of, of light and dark right um, and then Melkor destroys the two trees with the help of... Oh, the spider. Yeah, Ungoliant. Ungoliant. Yeah. And, um, and at that point, they have to take the fruits of the two trees, and that's where they get the sun and the moon. Right, right. right. So, and, and then you have a de- very definite night and day, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, all, and, and even then, compared to when we're looking at now in the Third Age, this was a long, long time ago that all this was happening. And so, and, and you have all the intrigue with the... Uh, theft of the Silmarils and um, uh, and you know everything that happens in the Silmarillion and even as Morgoth is defeated um, there's still this sense that all of the evil that he wrought is still kind of you know carrying along and reproducing in mm-hmm. different and various ways and the, the seeds that he sowed are still coming to fruition you know in different ways throughout the world so there's right. just this sense among the elves that no matter what, their their reign in this part of the world is coming to an end, right? They're fighting this long defeat, right? Right. They're not just abandoning it, you know, but it's it's inevitable that eventually their power is going to diminish to a point where they can't. It's not reasonable for them to back. stay there anymore, right? You know? Yeah. Um, so even though they've like they've been you know they've suffered some pretty big defeats so far, but they've been able to kind of cut their losses and move on, mm-hmm. right? Like, when the lamps were destroyed, they were able to take the fruit and make the sun and the moon, right? right? And and so they've, they've, so far, they've been able to keep going, but it's getting harder to do that. Things are definitely deteriorate, deteriorating right. mm-hmm. in their world. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and, um, and I won't say too much about it now, but this is, in, in the real world, this had a lot of significance. This idea of the long defeat had a lot of significance for Tolkien because, he, you know, again, he was living in this time where, you know, he witnesses, when he's a, when he's a young man, 
he you know so many of his generation died in World in World War One, which is a yeah. seemingly seemingly pointless war. Yeah. And then within a you know within a generation, Hitler comes along. Yeah. And they do fight him, but then it's like even after that, they win this great victory and it you know hard fought victory, costly victory, mm-hmm. and even then it's like all these other evil forces are you know kind of slowly taking over the world both you know you can kind of if you think of it just in the polarized opposites of the cold war both you know the evils of um you know many of the things that the soviet union carried out and many of the things that the united states carried out right Right. um no no side definitely was um you know just pristine the pristine angelic side in any of it right? right and um and so there's a political dimension to this as well but there's also a spiritual dimension there's very heavy spiritual dimension for tolkien you know Um, you can think about it in terms of, you know, his deep love for the Catholic Church, um, and his feeling that there's this, you know, just ongoing decline of its, of its influence and power, you know, to, to kind of form society around the, um, the principles of Christ, right? right, around the teachings of Christ. Um, and it actually goes back some to, uh, to his love for kind of the pre Christian. Uh, pagan works of, of Northern Europe and the pagan cultures of Northern Europe. Um, you know, his love for the poem Beowulf, which he views as kind of this bridge work between a pagan culture and a Christian culture. And um, in that, he very he talks about, in his essay on Beowulf, he talks about um, how the people, the pre-Christian pagans, detected, like, that they were fighting this long defeat. You know that that mm. they would fight against all of these, you know, forces, whatever the e- whatever the evil was to them. Yeah. And they they might win a victory here and now, but they couldn't hold out forever. Right. You know. Right. Yeah. And and this plays out in a major way in the rest of the Lord of the Rings. This whole idea of the long defeat yeah. plays out in a major way. Now, um, yeah. Well, I suspect at some point we'll do a we'll do an episode more of a deep dive on, on the concept of the long defeat because it's a yeah. really important one. But that's, you know, just a little aside on yeah. on what Tolkien, to, you know, what's going on in Tolkien's head when he talks about the long defeat. Yeah. Um, okay. So next we have Galadriel making some offers, right? And right. she basically is able to speak to each individual of the fellowship in their own minds and mm-hmm. kind of put a choice before them and we don't really hear anything about you know none of them are willing to speak of it you know it's like a test yeah 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 it's almost like what are you going you know and you wonder like is she offering them the ring like is she kind of testing them to see like would you take the ring if it was given to you Hmm. you know Hmm. i mean i think we'll hear more about this later on but they're all kind of like unwilling to talk about what she's going to talk about the most is sam but it seems like i mean she knows she picks out that one thing that that she knows they would most want, mm-hmm. like the thing dearest to them. Right. All of them, it seemed, had fared alike. Each had felt that he was offered a choice between a shadow full of fear that lay ahead and something that he greatly desired. A clear, a clear before his mind it lay, and to get it he had only to turn aside from the road and leave the quest and the war against Sauron to others. So, it's like... It's not always just handing them the ring. It's it could just be like turning aside and going back. You know, you have a choice. Mm-hmm. You can stay with this, or you can just go back and not fight the battle. It's almost like she's testing them. Like, how much do you want this? Yeah. Right. Like, it's kind of a, a foreshadowing to everything that lies ahead for them and how hard it's going to be. And she's like, if you want this, like, you have to be sure because mm-hmm. it's only going to get worse and it's only going to get more dangerous and it's only going to get harder. Yeah. So if you are going to turn back, do it now. Um, Boromir, you know, has the probably the most troubling reaction to this. He says, well, I do not feel too sure of this elvish lady and her purposes. And Aragorn rebukes him. You know, speak no evil of the Lady Galadriel. You know not what you say. There is in mm-hmm. her and in this land no evil unless a man bring it hither himself. Then let him beware. But tonight I shall sleep with it without fear for the first time since I left Rivendell. Um, so... You know, we get the sense that Boromir is really getting pushed to the limit. First of all, he didn't want to mm-hmm. even want to be here, and now he's, you know, he's feeling like he still doesn't trust Galadriel. Right. You know, he still Which, thinks... again, I can relate to that. Like, I mean, maybe I'm just a more suspicious person to start with, but, I mean, I, I like what he says, is he says mm-hmm. that she 
offered what she pretended to have the power to give. Yeah. I think that's a fair assessment given he doesn't know. Right. He doesn't have the history with these people that, you know, that Aragorn or Legolas do. He doesn't know. And if somebody has this way of looking into your mind and testing you in this very personal way, that would that would put, set me back too. Like, that would really make me raise my eyebrow and be like, Mm-hmm. Okay, is this good or evil? Like, I don't know. Right. It could really go either way. Yeah. So, anyway, um, I'm just saying. I yeah, feel, I mean, I, I feel I, Boromir here. I'm not saying that uh, Boromir is not, there's not a lot of sympathetic, you know, mm-hmm. being sympathetic about him, but we'll have more. Yeah. Later, is, later chapters will be yeah. more opportunities to talk about Boromir. And is he, he is just, he is the only member of this fellowship that is a complete man, right? Like, he is. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. he's the only one, I mean, Aragorn... Has some elvish has blood. Some, but, yeah. me, but Boromir is pure blood, pure-blooded mm-hmm. man. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yes. Um, yeah, so... Um, so after this after, after this episode, they, they all kind of go and, you know, to, to maybe have some rest, and they hear the elves singing a lament for, uh, for Mithrandir, which is the name they have for Gandalf. Yeah. Um... And Frodo, at that, decides that he's going to sing his own, um, his own song for, for Gandalf. Right. So let's uh, let's do that one. Okay. Uh, why don't you start? Okay. When evening in the Shire was gray, his footsteps on the hill were heard. Before the dawn, he went away on journey long without a word. From wilderland to western shore, from northern waste to southern hill, through dragon lair and hidden door and darkling woods, he walked at will. With dwarf and hobbit, elves and men, with mortal and immortal folk, with bird on bough and beast in den, in their own secret tongues he spoke. A deadly sword, a healing hand, a back that bent beneath its load, a trumpet voice, a burning brand, a weary pilgrim on the road. A lord of wisdom, throned he sat, swift in anger, quick to laugh, an old man in a battered hat, who leaned upon a thorny staff. He stood upon the bridge alone, and fire and shadow both defied. His staff was broken on the stone, and Khazadun, his wisdom, died. And so it's it's a little bit incomplete, but um, you know, pretty you know, pretty harrowing. You know, mm-hmm. it expresses a lot of grief on on Frodo's part. Yeah. Um, and then Sam adds his own little uh, addendum about the fireworks, the mm-hmm. finest rockets ever seen. They burst in stars of blue and green. Or after thunder, golden showers came falling like a rain of flowers. But, you know, Sam isn't satisfied. Doesn't feel like that does them justice. So, yeah. You know, I love Frodo here is so, like, you know, concerned with Gandalf's wisdom and everything. And Sam's just like, you forgot to say something about his fireworks. Right. You know? I know. I love that. I think it's it definitely, you know, kind of um, just back to what we talked about last episode about the relationship between Frodo and Sam. You know, a little bit of Sam's character. Like, that gives some really good insight. Mm-hmm. I think into into Sam. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it reminds you of what an important character Sam is in this because he he con- he consistently grounds, you know, brings this brings the story back and and the quest back to kind of a ground level, mm-hmm. right? You mm-hmm. know, Frodo is too easily drawn up into the whole like elvish kind of kind of stuff, but Sam and and really Merry and Pippin as well kind of always bring it back to that. To that ground like simple ground level yeah you know? that's true that's true yeah good point um <clears throat> so um so after this lament they're speaking about the you know uh the elves and you know what is what does sam think of the elves now um he says, they're all elvish enough but they're not all the same now these folk aren't wanderers or homeless and seem a bit nearer to the likes of us they seem to belong here even more than hobbits do in the Shire. Whether they've made the land or the land's made them, it's not. It's hard to say if you take my, me- my meaning. It's wonderfully quiet here. Nothing seems to be going on, and nobody seems to want it to. If there's any magic about, it's right down deep where I can lay my hands on it in a manner of speaking. You can see and feel it everywhere, said Frodo. Well, said Sam, you can't see nobody working it. No fireworks like poor Gandalf used to show. I wonder we don't see nothing of the Lord and Lady in all these days. I fancy now that she could do some wonderful things if she had a mind. I'd dearly love to see some elf magic, Mr. Frodo. Um, so, 
Sam calls out kind of a qualitative difference between the magic here and other sorts of magic. You know, he, he says, like, the elves have some kind of magic, but it's not the kind of magic that comes, you know, that is, like, obviously magic. Right, it's not, like, in-your-face yeah. magic, yeah. It seems a much more organic kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And almost more like a natural magic, you know? Almost more like a feeling, like something more... Um, graceful magic, I guess. Yeah, graceful, not not so temporal, but more... Ar- Areth, what's that word? Arethral? Ethereal. Ethereal. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and at this, <clears throat> Galadriel approaches and um, she <laughs> says, uh, "Even as he spoke, they saw as if she came in answer to their words." The Lady Galadriel approaching, tall Maybe. and white and fair, she walked beneath the trees. She spoke no word, but beckoned to them. Yeah, that's definitely a you know for effect there. <laughs> Yeah. I'm glad real. This is how I, this is how I roll. If I were Sam, I'd be like, yeah, I didn't really mean everything that I just said, and I'm out yeah. here. <laughs> but they talk some more about magic because she mm-hmm. so she shows them the mirror. Um, right. And I was thinking about the mirror in a way as like kind of um, kind of like the examine, you know, like mm-hmm. it's this way of reflect. You know, the mirror of Gladriel is this way of reflecting someone's own preoccupations and thoughts mm-hmm. back to them, and so. The examine is this um, Ignatian spirituality kind of thing where um, it's a daily thing that you do, or maybe even more often, uh, that you're always kind of seeking to kind of be able to examine your own motives behind things. Kind of see yourself from outside yourself. Exactly. That's how, that's actually how Ignatius puts it. Um, We're talking about St. Ignatius of Loyola. He talks about, you know, at the end of the day, it's always good to do you know, maybe when you're lying in bed or whatever, just to, to take a moment and kind of review the day and the things that you did, your preoccupations, um, the the acts that you carried out, whether they were good or evil, um, you know, how you reacted to certain situations, even even internally how you reacted to certain situations. Yeah. You know, and to say, am I entrusting this all to God, right? Am I, am I entrusting this to God or am I, like, preoccupied with other things, right? And so it's this way of kind of, dealing with the bad, you know, your own motives and, and forming them along the purpose that they really need to be going in. Got it. So the, the mirror of Gladriel, as I was reading at this time, reminded me of that. I can see why. Yeah. Good call. Um, so, um, Gladriel is speaking with Sam, um, and she, she addresses Sam first, you know, in terms of the mirror. And she says, did you not say that you wish to see elf magic? Um, and then Sam says, yes, I'd, I'd like to see it. Um, but, uh, Sam looks in and he has a, he has kind of a, a terrifying vision of really awful things happening to the Shire. Yeah. Um, he sees Ted Sandyman tearing down trees that he shouldn't and then they're building and then they sees them building up, uh, this big red, uh, chimney, uh, next to a building and there's this black smoke pouring out of it. He says, there's some devilry at work in the Shire, right? So, in a way, that this might be what Sam was shown in his mind before, right? That there's some, you know, it's, he's, he's being called back to the Shire. It's like, you got to go back to the Shire and help. Yeah. And it's like, so are you going to go do that, or are you going to go continue with Frodo on this journey? You know? Yeah. As I mean, oftentimes, that's kind of the choices we're offered in, situ- you know, in, in difficult situations, right? Right. It's like, do we keep doing the thing that's, you know, the right that's in front of us, or do we become preoccupied with some greater... You know, last episode. I guess I'm more personal. The last, the last uh, chapter episode, we were talking about social media, and I feel mm-hmm. like with the prevalence of the internet today, it's easy to get wrapped up in all of the things that are wrong in the world oh, instead of sure. instead of like, what's in front of me, mm-hmm. right? What what are the things that are right in front of me? Am I more concerned about yeah. you know what's going on in the Middle East or in Europe or you know in the in another state or whatever, or am I concerned about doing you know seeking the justice and doing the things that are right in front right of me. Right in front of me. Yeah. yeah. These are things that you can actually affect change in. Right. right. Like, don't don't try to... Because there's, you know, worrying about stuff that's happening overseas or whatever, there's nothing you can do about that. Mm-hmm. Like, physically do about it. You can pray well, about it, but that's all. And it's not it's not that you can't do anything about it either. It's just, it's harder to do something about it. Well, and, yeah. Much, much harder. And is it just... And, and I think the root is it is it distracting you away from the things you really should be right. doing. Right. It's, it's taking your focus away from 
from what you really need to be doing. It's almost like this draw into a certain kind of pride, a very subtle form Mm -hmm. of pride. It's like, well, I need to be the hero for these people way over here. And it's like, no, you need, you need to be doing the right thing, you know, helping out in the situation that's in front of you. Right. 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 Is what you really need to be doing. Absolutely. Um, and initially Sam says he has to go home. Mm -hmm. Like he says, "I, I must go home. Right. And it seems like he's pretty much made up his mind to do that. And then Galadriel, you know, basically says, "You can't, you can't go alone, right?" And but what what she says after that is interesting because she says, "Remember that the mirror shows many things, and not all have yet come to pass. Some never come to be, unless those that behold the visions turn aside, unless those that behold the visions turn aside from their path to prevent them. The mirror is dangerous as a guide of deeds." So that's kind of like my first thought when I read that. I was like, well, why the heck did you show it to them then? Mm-hmm. Like, this is doing no good. This is just confusing them and upsetting them and distracting them. Yeah. Right? And it's, But it was interesting to me, too, that she says that never, some of these things may never come to pass unless you go try to prevent them. Mm-hmm. So what, what Sam saw in the Shire might not actually happen unless he did go home to try to prevent right. it. Right, right. It's kind of mind-boggling. <laughs> Like, yeah, well, hard to wrap your brain around. And I think you know. So, is this a good thing that she shows them this or not? I mean, I feel like, I think Tolkien's answer to that would be yes, it is a good thing because she's testing them. She's yes. she's purifying them. Right. 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 Um, and and in a large way, that's when we talk about the examine earlier. That's the role of the examine. Mm-hmm. You know, is to pure is to purify your intentions. Right. Yes. Like, like what am I actually? Am I? Do I have a good recognition of who I am and what I'm capable of? And mm-hmm. Um, of and of what I'm called to be doing right now yeah. or am I concerned about all these other things because that's a brilliant insight it's like you know and maybe it's that if if he wasn't shown these things now he might be tempted later by an evil force with the same things mm-hmm. right and it might be harder to overcome it then when the when the path ahead is even harder true. right the path forward is even harder it that's might be true. easier to go back and say well I'm just going to go back and try and help out in the Shire mm-hmm you know, mm-hmm. that's a good point. Um. So yeah, there's a lot of like just spiritual wisdom mm-hmm. here in. Mm-hmm. Um. And Frodo looks. He doesn't want to at first, but he decides he will. Yeah. And um, he sees a figure that he thinks might be Gandalf, who's in white, or it might be Saruman. Right. He's not really sure. Um. He saw. He almost called aloud the wizard's name, and then he saw that the figure was clothed not in gray but in white, in a white that shone faintly in the dusk. And in its hand there was a white staff. The head was so bowed that he could see no face, and presently the figure turned aside, round a bend in the road, and went out of the mirror's view. Doubt came into Frodo's mind. Was this a vision of Gandalf on one of his many journeys long ago, or was it Saruman? Um, yeah, so... Um, and then he's shown that vision changes, and he's shown a different vision um, of a of a of a populous city, a river flowing through a populous city, a white fortress with seven towers, and um, and uh, again a ship with black sails. But now it was morning again, um, and the you small ship Bilbo. passed away. Did you mention that he saw Bilbo? Uh, yeah, he briefly sees Bilbo, right? Yeah, that's what I meant. I didn't hear you mention it, but I'm sure that you did. Yes, he does. Um. Yeah, the thing with the ship confused me. Mm-hmm. I, what? I think that's the stuff that that lies ahead, and mm-hmm. um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It may. I think. I mean, I think the the city with seven towers is Gondor, um, which I don't know. That that's interesting. It reminds me of a. There's a U two song called um, "Running to Stand Still," hmm. and um, and there's a line in there that says, uh, "I see seven towers, but I only see one way out." Hmm. But I don't think it's a reference. I don't know that Bono is a particularly, like, he's not a Tolkien know, buff. Tolkien buff. Um, <laughs> I think he's referring to something that's actually in, like, Dublin or something. But, oh, okay. Um, but anyway, it's just an interesting little, yeah. you know, kind Some of incident. vision. Because it's a vision in the song, and then it's a vision here. Yeah. Um, I didn't know what to make of that either, though. I mean, I, I kind of assume it has to do with the battle that's going to be raging at Gondor. Mm-hmm. Um, and... So maybe he's just being shown that this is in the future. Okay. Um, so, um, 
and then uh, and then next the eye right yeah. the eye of Sauron so terrible was it that Frodo stood rooted unable to cry out or to withdraw his gaze the eye was rimmed with fire but was itself glazed yellow as a cat's watchful and intent and the black slit of its pupil opened on a pit a window into nothing that makes me think like um, like really terrible things like like to see can be like that like where they're not um, it's almost like you can't like I remember as a kid like if I would watch a scary movie sometimes it'd be hard almost like I wouldn't I wouldn't want to watch it but like it would hard be to hard away. to look away yeah. yeah I'd want to look away want to close my eyes but then you'd be you know, just looking, captivated yeah yeah it, it's a weird effect the more I don't know curiosity. or it's like you know when when 9-11 happened and like you mm -hmm. know how many times did you watch the video of like the yeah, the towers. Towers, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's a, yeah. it's a spectacle, but it's it's an evil, horrible spectacle, but it's still this, like, kind of, like, I can't believe that happened, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So it's weird how drawn. Well, it's so shocking, too, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, it's just something that I think just, like, like you, you're, it's like your brain can't even process it mm -hmm. and even tell you to look away. It's just, yeah, it's just so overwhelming. Yeah. And that's what's happening in Frodo here. It would okay. seem so. Yeah. And he even starts to draw <clears throat> him in. And, like, he, mm -hmm. he even, like, starts to lean into the water. Right. Um, and Frodo, uh, Galadriel warns him, do not touch the water. Mm -hmm. The vision faded, and Frodo found that he was looking at the cool stars twinkling in the silver basin. He stepped back, shaking all over, and looked at the lady. I know what it was that you last saw, for this is also my, in my mind. Do not be afraid. But do not think that only by singing amid the trees, nor even the slender arrows of elven bows, is, the land, is this land of Lothlorien maintained and defended against its enemy. I say to you, Frodo, that even as I speak to you, I perceive the Dark Lord and know his mind, or all of his mind that concerns the elves. And he gropes ever to see me in my thought, but still the door is closed. Um, and this next thing is cool. She lifted up her arms and spread out her hands towards the east in a gesture of rejection and denial. Arendil, the evening star, most beloved of the elves, shone clear above. So there you have the uh, uh, the star, right? The Silmaril. Mm -hmm. The oh, Silmaril yeah. in the sky. Yeah. So bright was it that the figure of the elven lady cast a dim shadow on the ground. Its rays glanced upon a ring about her finger. It glittered like polished gold overlaid with silver light and a white stone, and it twinkled as if the evening star had come down to rest upon her hand. Frodo gazed at the ring with awe, for suddenly it seemed to him that he understood. Um... Yes, it is not permitted to speak of it, and Elrond could not do so. But it cannot be hidden from the ring-bearer, and one who has seen the eye. Verily it, 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 verily it is in the land of Lorien, upon the finger of Galadriel, that one of the three remains. This is Ninya, the ring of Adamant, and I am its keeper. Um, so Sauron suspects, but he does not know for sure yet. So is that what the eye was looking for? Um, yes. I mean, I think it's looking for He's her. looking for the rings. And looking for the ring, right? Okay. Um, but is it looking for Frodo's ring, or is it looking for her ring? He just senses that there's that they're I think, there. I think okay. he's looking for both. Okay. Um, yeah, and then Frodo kind of turns the tables on Galadriel then. He says, and what do you wish? Mm -hmm. And she says that what should be... Um, Shall be. Or first she says that um, if you succeed, then our power is diminished, and Lothlorien will fade, and the tides of time will sweep it away. We must depart into the west or dwindle to a rustic folk of Dell and Cave, slowly to forget and to be forgotten. Um, so that sounds like a lose-lose, right? Because she says if you fail, mm -hmm. then we're laid there to the enemy. If you succeed, then our power is diminished and we're going to fade. Well, and I think... And it's like... Yeah, but I think the elves have in mind also, because they're the elder children of Iluvatar, first of all, they, they can go to the Blessed Realm, right? Mm-hmm. Well, and... that's true, yeah. And but also they have a responsibility, but they're not let in automatically, right? They can't just, you know, they the elves that are all over here in some way have turned their backs on the blessed realm at one point or another, right? right? So right. there's kind of repentance and penance that has to be done, you know, in that way. Um, and um, and I think for the elves, there has to in order to achieve that, they have to basically. Um, help the other peoples of Middle Earth who aren't capable of going, you know, to the Blessed Realm, right? Mm -hmm. Who aren't immortal. Yes, right? okay. I think that's, I mean, I think that's the connection there is there has to be this kind of sacrifice on their part, you know, a willingness to help. Which is still better than being laid bare to the enemy. But right. it's, it's going to be 
it, it at least lets it be the long defeat rather than the immediate defeat. Right. right. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So it's it's still it's not going to be like an immediate. Um, it's not like everything's just going to be hunky dory. Right. And they're going to be living in Mayberry again. Like it's still going to be hard, even mm-hmm. if Frodo succeeds. Yeah. Um. And she says. To Frodo's question of what do you wish, she says that what should be shall be. The love of the elves for their land and their works is deeper than the deeps of the sea, and their regret is undying and cannot over wholly be assuaged. Yet they will cast all away rather than submit to Sauron, for they know him now. For the fate of Lothlorien you are not answerable, but only for the doing of your own task. Yet I could wish, were it of any avail, that the One Ring had never been wrought or had remained forever lost. So, Galadriel... um, uh, Gladriel basically says, like, you know, because at one point Sauron had repent, had seemingly repented long mm-hmm. ago, mm-hmm. and it seemed to be kind of a good guy. Yeah. But he's always kind of gone back on his word and become the enemy again. And so they're like, we know him now, and um, and what they want, they don't want to leave any of this behind, but uh, but their task um, is, you know, to help is to help in the defeat of Sauron. Right. Um, and Frodo give, it, that offers to give her the One Ring, mm-hmm. um, just like he'd offered to give it to Gandalf, right? He's just trying to get rid of it. Like, just whoever wants this thing, just take it from me, please. Yeah. I can't deal anymore. Um, and she says, "Wise, I might be, I may be. Yet here she has met her match in courtesy. Gently are you revenged for my testing of your heart at our first meeting. You begin to see with a keen eye. I do not deny that my heart has greatly desired to ask what you offer." For many long years I had pondered what I might do should the great ring come into my hands, and behold, it was brought within my grasp. The evil that was devised long ago works on in many ways, whether Sauron himself stands or falls. Would not that have been a noble deed to set to the credit of his ring, if I had taken it by force or fear from my guest? And now at last it comes, you will give me the ring freely. In place of the Dark Lord you will set up a queen, and I shall not be dark, but beautiful and terrible as the morning and the night. Fair as the sea and the sun and the snow upon the mountain, dreadful as the storm and the lightning, stronger than the foundations of the earth, all shall love me and despair. That's a great line right there, all shall love me and despair. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, you know, she is she is very tempted to take it. And, and, and again, it's a temptation to want to do good with it, right? Mm-hmm. To want to overcome Sauron. And establish kind of Galadriel's reign, but she right. recognizes this that in all of this, it'll be her undoing and the undoing of some of, of all the things that she really loves and that she aims to save by it, right? Which that takes a lot of a lot of strength mm-hmm. um, and foresight on her part. Yes, I indeed. remember the scene in the movie very clearly. Yeah, like it's really kind of scary. Yeah, oh yeah. Remember how she like gets super big and tall and like starts talking in this like echoey voice and it's almost like she's it's almost a vision of what she would become if she took the ring because she's mm-hmm. very kind of monstrous yeah you know not yeah she starts it. like um uh, like glowing right exactly yeah. like not in like a not in like the way that the balrog was monstrous but still because she was still you know was obviously you know not dark or whatever but it was still like ooh kind of scary right now yeah yeah well and elsewhere it talks about how the the ring does for different people who possessors according to their stature right right and gladrail is obviously a great elf lady right mm-hmm. i mean so she, she the, the ring would allow her to become almost goddess like you know yeah. um, which props to her for not taking it because that's yeah. a very tempting a tempting notion mm-hmm um, but she passes, she says, I pass the test. I will diminish and go into the West and remain Galadriel. So she's able to turn down the ring. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so last of all, Frodo asks for one more thing. He says, a thing which I often meant to ask Gandalf and Rivendell. I am permitted to wear the one ring. Why cannot I see all the others and know the thoughts of those who wear them? And she says, you have not tried. Only thrice have you set the ring upon your finger since you knew what you possessed. Do not try. It would destroy you. Did not Gandalf tell you that the rings give power according to the measure of each possessor? Before you could use that power and would need to become far stronger, 
that you would need to become far stronger and to train your will to the domination of others. Yet even so, as ring bearer and as one that has borne it on finger and seen that which is hidden, your sight is grown keener. You have perceived my thought more clearly than many that are accounted wise. You saw the eye of him that holds the seven and the nine, and did you not see and recognize the ring upon my finger? Did you see my ring? she asked, turning again to Sam. No, lady, he answered, to tell you the truth. I wondered what you were talking about. I saw a star through your fingers, but if you'll pardon me speaking out, I think my master was right. I wish you'd take his ring. You'd put things to rights. You'd stop them digging up the gaffer and turning him adrift. You'd make some folk pay for their dirty work. I would, she said. That is how it would begin. But it would not stop with that, alas. We will not speak more of it. Let us go. So, uh, good little last bit of philosophizing upon the nature of the ring, you know, and of wanting, and you know, and of what the ring in a way represents, which is wanting to, a means of doing good that is nevertheless illicit, right? It's against the law, right? Yeah. It's, uh, it's against, in this case, the law of who these different people are, right? Right. What they're, what they're created to be, you know? So in this case, the end does not justify the means. Right. Right. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Yeah, I mean, I think it's very out. Like she, wa- like she wants to help. She wants to do good, and she's like, "Yeah, I would make things right, and that's how it would start." But it wouldn't say that way. Right. Right. That's that's a very wise, you know, very wise insight on her part. Yeah. All right. Well, any other thoughts on the chapter? I don't think so. You? Um, I just got the. Ah, that's a good thought. Yeah. Let's think about doing haikus. Yes, indeed. Another uh, another round of rock paper scissors for us. Yeah, just one moment. I'm I'm, I'm checking up on something. Checking right. up. Uh, what am I supposed to do? With this dead airspace. I don't know. Should I tell a story? Sorry. All right. Here we go. I'm ready now. You're ready now. Okay. All right. Ready? Rock paper scissors. Rock paper scissors. Shoot. I'm on to you. Rock paper scissors. Shoot. Oh. Darn it! Uh-huh. Darn it! Rats! Oh well. Uh, Better luck went. next time. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, I'll go first. Okay. I got two, so. Okay. I'll I only one, got one. You can do one. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Sad songs, no justice can do to Gandalf's greatness. Yet sing, they shall still. Oh, that's sweet. Yeah. I like that. I like that a lot. Alright, here's mine. Mirror and window. Evil tidings. Securing the fellowship's quest. Nice. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We kind of talked about that. Yeah. About how it was a test and it was, they were, he, she was refining them. Right? Oh, yeah. I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. That was, uh, that was back in episode 69, right? Are we seriously on episode 69 right now? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Hmm. Go anywhere. Well, haiku two for me. All right. right. Visions of greatness, of righteous bliss, like sirens, the one ring beckons. Hmm. Do you know what the sirens are? I do. It's from the Odyssey, right? Yeah. Yeah. But you didn't capitalize it, so it threw me off. Oh, sorry. Well, you shouldn't be reading it. You should listen. I can. I can understand visual if I can read. There you go. Now. There. Now. That's better. I understand now. Okay. Like, are you talking about, like, a police siren or, like, the sirens? Woo, 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 woo. Yeah. I love the Odyssey. It's such a great story. Yeah. That's good. I like it. I like, I like your, uh, what's that called? Analogy? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. It's called a, um, I guess that would be a simile. Oh, because you Figure use like? Speech. Yeah. Oh, yeah, analogy is what this is to this as that is to that. Yeah. I didn't do well in the English part of my SAT, in case anybody was wondering. That's all right. 
I'll still allow you to be the co-host. I didn't do well in my math part either. Oh, I better stop. This isn't true confession time. Okay, go ahead. All right, well, Oh, wait, next... that was yours. Oh, yeah. that was your second one. So okay. next up, we got our guest. So we've got Rob. Rob, coming through again. Um, here we go. Here's Rob's haiku. On her hand, a ring, perilous, righteous, and fair. Wise Galadriel. I like that. That's really good. Perilous. Mm-hmm. Righteous and wise and fair. All shall love me in despair. Yeah. Nice. Good job, Rob. Wonderful. Thanks, right. Rob. Josh. Josh! Here's Josh's IQ. Shining like the sun. Greatest Noldor legacy. She, Galadriel. Hmm. I like that. Nicely done. So she's an Noldor? Yeah. Well, yeah. She's. We talked about that, right? She's related to... She's oh, Defin Arfin. Arfin. That's right. Noldor. Yep. Yeah. I get all the Elven tribes mixed up. Cut me some slack here, okay? Yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah, it's Uncle Fëanor. Uncle Fëanor, you know. That's right. Half Uncle Fëanor. Pretty, uh, pretty impressive lineage there. Yeah. Good job, Josh. Well done. Thank you, guys. Well done, Josh. All right. Well, oh, for next time. Um, so for chapters, uh, for book two, chapter eight, and book two, chapter nine of Fellowship. Um, we will, the haiku for those are due on August 3rd. So, uh, we're going to try and kind of get to a regular schedule with those where the haiku is due, like, you know, kind of early part of the month for the, for you the shouldn't say due. I think reading. it sounds like homework. Homework's not fun. Okay, well. Should be sent in by. Should be sent in by, which is the same thing as due. But it sounds not like homework. Well, it sounds like optional homework. It's at least. not homework. You don't have to do them. I know, but when you say something is due, like I think that puts people like, <gasps> I gotta do this by this time. Okay, if we don't have them by this time, then we can't guarantee they'll make it into the episode. There we go. There we go. So make sure you send them in by yeah August third. Which we want we want people to send them in. So we know. do we yeah. do, but we don't want them to feel like it's homework. We want it to be fun and optional. You're trying, you're trying to be the good cop. I am. I am the good cop. Please. Yeah. Everybody's figured that out by now. All right. So please, okay. send them in by August 3rd. Please, Do please. It. We only had two of these last couple episodes, and they were awesome. Yeah. But it'd be great to I have, have twice as many. I have feeling that, that I misplaced Mary Grace's, but I haven't been able to find it. I was looking for it right there. How could you misplace an email? Well, I get a lot of email. Sense. I'm an important person, and lots of people email me. <laughs> uh, lucky you. Um, just keep it simple. One uh, if, email. If now. I did, if I did mea culpa, and uh, I'll try and we'll, we'll get them on future episode when I find them. You know we will. Yeah, maybe we'll just do a standalone episode just for Mary Grace's missing haiku. <laughs> <laughs> the legend of Mary Grace's missing haiku. <laughs> oh, sounds like a mystery. Yeah. Sounds like it should be a, like a Nancy Drew, a Nancy <laughs> Drew book. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Okay. Alrighty. Well, thanks, John. Thank you, Greta. Yeah, this was fun. I'll, uh, I guess we'll, we'll talk to each other next episode. Probably I guess not, probably, probably not, not between then. Probably not all. before then. Yeah. No. Alright. Um, but yeah, I'll look forward to that. Me too. Okay, great. Alright. Alright, well, thank you guys for listening. Thanks for sending in the haikus. Yep, thanks everybody. Talk at you next time. Bye, y'all. Bye bye. Please remember to check out truemyths.org for show notes and plenty of other Tolkien goodness. Also, if you're enjoying the podcast, would you please leave the Tolkien Road a rating and feedback on iTunes? It's a great way to support the show and takes less than a minute. On our next episode, we'll be focusing on Gandalf, and especially his origin, background, and various names. Our discussion of Lord of the Rings will continue on August 6th with Book 2, Chapter 8, Farewell to Lorien. Thanks again for listening, and until next time, the road goes ever on. 